Welcome everybody to the third edition of On the Ball, the new video interview series from Vanderbilt Sports and Society. Uh, really excited to have a good friend of mine and uh, best baseball writer in the country with us, Tyler Kepner. Uh, Tyler, thank you for coming on. Well, you're welcome. It's a very nice intro. Thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, I'm impressed with your hat collection behind you. I like the old Mariners hat. I think the best back there, possibly. The old brown Padres hat is ne very nice. I noticed no Brewers hat back there. No, we I do have it somewhere underneath those, um, but but not uh, not up there. I don't know. I have I have all the AL West. I think for some reason. Um, <laughs> Texas, Anaheim, Houston, A's, and Mariners, but the rest are just sort of random. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, if you were looking to get in good graces with your interviewer, you would have had the Brewers front and center. So I would have, but but I do have this. We are both. Um, we both have have one of these, right? <laughs> there you go. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Student, Student Communications Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Congratulations, so keep that, Tyler. Keep that very close to me, right here. <laughs> well, I've always said that one of these days you're going to be, what's it called, the Spink Award for uh, Baseball Journalist in the Baseball Hall of Fame? Uh, well, we changed it to the BBWA Career Excellence Award. Career that's, Excellence. Yeah, that's that's very nice of you. I, I, I get in line behind a lot of other uh, qualified, uh, you know, veteran writers who, who deserve it before me. But that, we, that, would be a, that would be an amazing honor someday. Yeah, well, someday it'll happen, and it'll happen for Buster Olney, our fellow uh, Vanderbilt alum baseball writer yeah. as well. Yeah, let's hope so. He's he's uh, he's forged a great path for uh, for, for me and, and lots of others. Absolutely. Well, what we wanted to talk to you today was about the uh, World Series and your new book, The Grandest Stage, uh, History of the World Series. Uh, fantastic book. And uh, yeah. just as someone that's been a baseball fan, uh, as long as I can remember, the World Series is obviously, you know, such a pivotal moment of the year and something that just that means so much to sports fans and has meant so much just to America, you know, over the years. And so I wanted to talk to you about the book, but also the World Series sort of place in in our culture. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I know that you were a, a kid baseball writer and that your yeah. uh, career really goes back to your childhood. Uh, and for those who don't know that story, Tell us about what you used to do at, at Vets Veterans Stadium and um, your earliest uh, baseball writing. Yeah, well, I, I realized um, when I was, uh, you know, probably about 13 or so that um, baseball writing could be a, a, a fun career. Um, you know, I was lucky to cut, to grow up outside Philadelphia at a time when they had a lot of great um, baseball writers, specifically um, Jason Stark. Um, and to be able to read him all the time, the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, really kind of stoked a passion for writing and in seventh grade a friend of mine uh named john and i had the same class as same class schedule we were really into baseball card collecting we used to read that beckett baseball card monthly so we just started to like kind of do our own version of it and eventually it morphed into um uh, uh less about lists and, and cards and, and and trivia games and stuff and, and more just about um writing and 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 my you know, expressing my love of baseball and my opinions and my and my thoughts about it um, through a magazine. And so I published that really um, all throughout high school and um, even through my first year at Vandy. It helped me get the scholarship, the Grant Rice scholarship that you also won, mm -hmm. uh, Fred Russell. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it was it was just an amazing way to to grow up because it really um you know, exposed me at a very young age to the world of Major League Baseball and how I fit into it. Um, and I felt like, you know, of the thing that I did best um, within the baseball universe would be to write about it and to tell stories. And, um, you know, doing all those interviews uh, at Vet Stadium and, and, and other places um, where I get press passes um, at a young age really gave me... Um, you know, understanding of, of 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 how the baseball ecosystem moves you know what a, how, how to how to engage these guys and uh you know and then also just being interviewed myself about the magazine i, I think i gained a certain empathy for what it's like to be interviewed and, and that has really helped ever since okay so how, how as a kid did you get a press pass and what are one or two of the most memorable exchanges you had with major leaguers whether <laughs> positive or did you have any sort of crusty old guys like 
<laughs> Get the heck out of here, kid. <clears throat> You're not real. <laughs> yeah, not real. I mean, like, <clears throat> you know, only a couple of guys really blew me off. I mean, Bonds blew me off. He blew off everybody. Um, I think uh, the player named Mike Sharperson blew me off once. Um, <laughs> Pinella told me to get out of there, which is funny because I ended, ended up being the beat writer for the Mariners, you know, covering the Mariners a few years <laughs> later. And I knew Lou in all of his many moods. Um, but uh, most of the players were great. You just, um, you know, you just introduce yourself, uh, treat them with respect and don't, you know, just basically read the room, you know, and, and, and whether they're, if they're doing something else, don't approach them. But if they're not doing anything or if they're just sitting around, you can approach them and talk to them and, and show, I show, I would show them what I was doing and, um, you know, give respect to get respect. It really was really, they were, I, I expected um, a lot of hostility just because that's kind of what you would hear, um, you know, about, about players or about, the, you know, hostile relations with the media and that, and it really wasn't like that at all. I, I still think, you know, Hollywood and, and, and the, you know, pop culture portrayal of, of uh, players and media is a lot more antagonistic than it really is. Most of those guys are perfectly fine. They're just people like us, perfectly professional. If you approach them in a professional way with respect, you, you get it in return. So um, I learned that at a young age and it's, it's really helped uh, demystify the whole thing because it's just it's just people conversing um yeah and how did i get a press pass i i, I did have one um really uh lucky in which is that my dad was in the army reserves um with dave montgomery who was executive vice president of the phillies at the time and and so you know he was a family friend someone we could you know i could send a letter to and and you know and, and get you know i went on my career day in eighth grade with dave and he took me all around the vet and um introduced me to different different people um you know in the phillies organization and then when i was doing this little magazine uh you know i, I think dave you know gave a little nudge to the uh pr department and said hey you just let this kid in just see you know give him a field pass or two and just see how he does and left it at that and um once i got uh once i got in um i think they saw that i could handle myself fine and um and away we go. Uh, but the, uh, my favorite story, though, is um, in 94, it was the last year I was doing the magazine. It was between my <clears throat> freshman and sophomore years at Vanderbilt. And um, it was the last, you know, really the end of it that, that I was doing it. Um, the strike was coming up and I was going to be a sophomore. I was going to be a sports editor. And so I didn't of the hustler. Um, but I was wearing a Vanderbilt shirt that day to a Phillies Padres game. And Tony Gwynn, who I talked to every year because he's just was such a wonderful uh insightful and, and 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 nice guy um he looked at my shirt and he said you go to Vanderbilt now I said yeah and he said you know our beat writer went to Vanderbilt his name is Buster Only you got to meet him he covers us for the San Diego Union Tribune so you know Tony went and found Buster and he brought him down to the dugout where we were talking and and that's how I met Buster um I didn't know you know there was no internet really back then I didn't know I hadn't heard of Buster and um I remember thinking, what's a Buster only? You know, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah, Buster became a, a great friend and, 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 and mentor and, and, and advocate for me. And so that's the summer of 94. And then four years later, when I'm out of college, um, I'm covering the Angels for the paper in Riverside, California, uh, my first job. Um, Buster tells his sports editor, hey, there's this, this kid out in California. He he's, uh, might be a good prospect someday for us. Um, keep an eye on him. And so when I would come to New York with the Angels or then with the Mariners, um, I would just sort of, you know, have coffee or whatever with the Times uh, sports editor, Neil Amder. And um, he hired me in January 2000 and uh, I'm still there. Wow. Amazing. So thanks to Tony Gwynn for, for uh, playing <laughs> yeah. match manager, you know. What a guy. What a guy. Yeah. Um, and so you also have a pretty unique uh, party trick where you can name the starting pitchers in any World Series game, uh, like the top of your head, uh, from 1979 on. I sure can, yeah. It's a yeah. party trick that, that there's never any parties about that. But no. if, there, <laughs> if there were, I'd be the star. I'd, I'd be the star of the party. <laughs> Maybe if I ever host a nerd party, like you'll yeah. be the hit of, of the party. So right. <laughs> I thought throughout this interview, I'll just throw out some years and games to you, and you can impress us all with your knowledge. So 1984, game four. Game four, that was the Saturday afternoon game. Jack Morris pitched a complete game against uh, Eric Shaw. And Trammell had a home run early, and the Tigers took a 3-1 lead in the series. Yeah. <laughs> it's the last afternoon game in the outdoor uh, 
Dale Park. Very impressive. Okay, so <laughs> getting back to your yes. book, I'm, I'm not going to act impressed with any of these. I'm just going to like throw them out there. You can matter of factly answer them. Um, yes. In your book, you talk about the first World Series you ever saw was a kid. Speaking of uh, the vet, it was at Veteran Stadium, and sounds mm -hmm. like it was uh, just a pivotal, pivotal and memorable moment for you. I've never been to a World Series game. That my team, the Brewers, has only been to one. I was 12 years old, not living in Wisconsin, wasn't able to go. Um, but you've what do you remember about that first experience? I'm sorry. You've never been to a World Series game. No, I've never. Well, I was going to say I've never been to even a postseason game, but I have my in a weird circumstances. My dad and I went in 1981, the strike year living in D.C., took a train up to New York and saw the Brewers Yankees games, uh, games oh, three, wow. four and five of that series in the AL East playoffs in yeah. 1981. And that's the last postseason baseball that I've ever seen in person wow the first postseason game I saw was was or the first game I ever saw really was um in that mini playoffs also the Expos and Phillies Expos is that right wow. game um but yeah so you know the Phillies had won the series in 80 um they had just this power pack team um Mike Schmidt Steve Carlton Pete Rose uh Tug McGraw you know Gary Matthews the uh, Gary Maddox. It was just, it was, it, they had Tony Perez that year and Joe Morgan. Um, they were called the Wheeze Kids because they were uh, older and, and the Wiz Kids were the young ones in, in 1950. Um, and we got tickets to uh, the two home playoff games against the Dodgers, which they won, which I wasn't expecting them to win. And because um, the Dodgers had beaten the Phillies a lot that year, I think like 12 out of 13 times or something, 11 out of 12. Um, but then they got to the World Series. And I was supremely confident. I was like, oh, we're going to take care of the Orioles. No problem. Um, <clears throat> Phillies won the first game down in Baltimore. And then when they lost the second game, I wasn't too disappointed because I had tickets to games four and five. So now I'm like, all right, well, great. Now I'll get to see two games for sure. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. and that was that. I, so I blame myself for that. Um, I blame my brother for stealing my lucky hat before game four. Um, and they lost game four. And then they lost game five. But um Game four was my first game it was an afternoon, Saturday afternoon. Um, and yeah, it really um, did spark a lifelong love of, of the World Series, a lifelong fascination with the event. Just the idea that um, the whole baseball world was, was watching my team in my stadium um, where I would, you know, where, where the, my, my spot, they came to me, you know, it wasn't like yeah. you're going to a destination. Um, uh, you know, like the Super Bowl or something like that, which I also love. But I mean, the World Series is 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 special. It's just it 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 has a a flow, a rhythm to it. Um, you know, the 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 emotional pull of the of the way the games go. Like in that one, the Phillies winning Game One, you're really confident. Winning coming home Game Three, you're tied. Um, you know, one one, and then it just starts to slip away. They lose three, they lose four, they lose five, and it's always like, oh my God, like they just you know they lost all three at at home. Um, but over time, the the result of those of those games um, fades away, I mean, and 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 uh, you just remember how special it felt, and, and the anticipation, and um, seeing a team that you never saw before, because it was before interleague play, um, knowing that everything that was happening was going to be marked in history for all time, um, you know, and something that, that that people could could point to. Um, I just remember it all so well. I remember the foul ball I almost caught. I remember, you know, the, the certain plays when it was still in sunshine and then certain plays that later when it was, it was, um, you know, in the shadows and the Phillies making a late comeback and the Orioles using all these, uh, you know, pinch hitters. I, one of them was Ken Singleton, who I know pretty well from him being a Yankees broadcaster. And he's, he's like, I, I think you think about that World Series a lot more than I do. And I played it. So, you know. <laughs> Because he remembers the from ball players for Sam, yeah. right? He remembers like in '79 how he was the man, and they lost in seven. And he played every game because he was an outfielder. But by '83, he was at the end, and he was a, you know, DH, and that was a no no DH series. So he only got to pinch hit a few times, and yeah, they won it, but he didn't have much much to do with it. Yeah. Um, so that you know that gives you a little insight into like you know the players. They just think they think of it as a little differently because their role is 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 to play and ours is to watch and absorb. So, um, yeah, I mean, like they, they, it's rare that they look at it the same way that I might, um, which is why it was fun to do uh, this book, because occasionally you would find someone like that. Like I talked to a pitcher named Marty Beister, who who 
you know, came in in relief in one of those games and was a young pitcher. And he was saying that he went home after game five and was just sitting around his town. And I was like, how did we lose three in a row at home? You know, we have Mike Schmidt and Steve Carlton and Pete Rose and all these great guys. And how do we lose? You know, so like it, that, it, it, it was kind of cool sometimes when you can get those moments where you feel like the players do think um, like the fans. Yeah. 2001 game two. 2001 game two was a shutout by Randy Johnson um, out in the desert, and they beat he beat uh, Andy Pettit. Um, Andy was not good that series. Uh, they they had his signs in game six, um, which was just another you know Johnson Pettit rematch. But yeah, that was a I think it was four nothing. Um, but yeah, Johnson Pettit. One of the stories you tell in the book that gets to someone involved in the games, like actually appreciating it, you know, uh, in a way that a fan might is. And this actually was something about Tony La Russa. And as a Brewers fan, I've always, you know, felt uh, a little bit of a rivalry with the Cardinals or even, <laughs> uh, I don't know how I you always are, felt yeah. about La Russa, but that he told you something and he, ha he has actually done something as a manager in the World Series that not every manager does. And could you tell us about that? Yeah. So when I was uh, 13, it was the 88 World Series. And um, yeah, I would always stay up to watch, you know, the end of every series game. And that was... Game five, you know, Oral Hershiser is shutting down the the Dodgers, and it's pretty clear that, or shutting down the A's, and it's pretty clear the A's are going to lose, um, you know, and, and be eliminated that night. And so, with two outs and the Dodgers batting in the top of the at, in the top of the ninth, Larusa went out and brought in a new pitcher, a rookie named Todd Burns, and he hadn't pitched in the series, and he faced one batter, and he got him out. And so I always remembered how how kind of cool that was because it seemed like Larusa, who was this master strategist, um, was just bringing in a guy out of out of sentiment, you know, not matching up, not just just wanting a wanting this young Todd Burns to 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 get a little taste of it. And so I brought that up to him um, many years later, uh, before the eleven World Series, and uh, and Tony lit up like he really he 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 remembered that very well and. Um, and I called Todd Burns and asked him about it. And, and he, of course, remembered it really well. And, and um, that's something that Tony didn't have to do. But then you look, you look at all, a lot of LaRusso's World Series, and there's a lot of people who played just one game or got just one at bat. Um, and, you know, to Tony, it was, it, was a, it was important to have those guys be able to say that they played in the World Series. It was just, it mattered that much, you know, as going on the rest of their lives, that they could say that. And also that they could sort of feel like they were part of the team, you know, that they they were part of this family that he he tried to um, engender, you know, it, within the clubhouse that, hey, we, we all got it. We all got a shot at it. At it. We all got a, a little a little piece of this, um, you know, and maybe Albert Pujols will have a much bigger slice than Mitchell Boggs, let's say. But like, you know, everybody, everybody participates in, in that World Series. And you know, I don't think he's a hundred percent, but like he's really, really close um, with a lot of these Doug Jennings, Ken Phelps, Joe Clink kind of guy. You know, who who just come in for one game or one one at bat. Fernando Luna um, <clears throat> and uh, Hector Luna. I'm sorry, and um, you know, and and it's that was kind of neat to to, to share that with me. Absolutely. Okay, eighty two game seven. Well, geez, I mean that's your that's your wheelhouse. That's uh. Joaquin Andujar beat uh, Pete Vukovic, although Noel, well, I guess McClure got the loss probably, but um, yeah, it, it, Andujar pitched pretty well, as you know, and um, the Cardinals took the lead and, you know, I think that's sixth or seventh in England, but uh, it was, uh, that was Pete Vukovic. He was pitching with his arm basically falling off there. Um, and he was a Cy Young winner, but uh, I wrote about yeah. the game, the, the the game, the game before, which was which was it's in the book, you know, in the Unsung Heroes chapter, because that was one of my <clears throat> sort of formative games. That was the first series I watched, and and uh, I liked the Brewers because I didn't like the Cardinals, um, and so who does was, like the Cardinals? Who does? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted Milwaukee to win. That was a fun team with a fun you know logo on their hat and everything, and um, and they took a three two lead back to St Louis, and it was. John Sutton, you know, big star against a rookie named John Stuper. I'm like, well, this is a layup, you know, and, and then it turned out to be a blowout win. Um, then John Stuper pitched a complete game through all these rain delays. And, and he ended up coaching at Yale for 30 years. We talked about um, him having that one big moment in, a, in an otherwise uh, unremarkable career. Um, but just shows you that, you know, in this small sample size that the World Series is that uh, sometimes uh, John Stuper can beat 
Don Sutton, uh, yeah. while facing elimination. Yeah, that was a life lesson I learned <laughs> as a 12 year old yeah. that, that made me cry. Um, all right, when you think about the impact of the World Series just on society, I think probably the 1919 World Series is right up there as the, one of the most uh, important. And one of the things I like uh, about your book is the way you've divided up the chapters into uh, you know different aspects, different ways of looking at the World Series. And one of those ways is kind of like things you think you know, but maybe you don't know the whole story. Yeah. And so um, what would you tell us about the 1919 World Series, the Black Sox World Series that that maybe most people uh, don't think about or don't know. Well, there was another team in that series named the Cincinnati Reds and that they were better. Um, you know, they didn't have a lot of like big historic names like a shoeless Joe Jackson, um, but they were a team that was largely put together by Christy Mathewson, who had ended his career with one game with the Reds and, 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 and run that team for a couple of years before he went off to World War I, where unfortunately he he um, you know to toxic, was exposed to toxic gas and later you know died from it, um, but he was still around in 1919 watching that watching the team that he had put together. Um, and Matthewson was very astute. You know he acquired a lot of these pitchers who had great years. Um, they had uh, Ed Roush was a Hall of Famer. Um, Heine Grow with his bottle bat. I mean again like not a lot of big names, but that Reds team in 1919 was actually better by winning percentage than those big red machine teams. I mean, that team was, was better than the, better than the uh, White Sox. The White Sox didn't have Red Faber, who was a Hall of Fame pitcher who had been the big star of the 17 World Series. He was injured. So they were kind of undermanned anyway. They, they obviously had major uh, internal, uh, you know, dissension on that team uh, be before even the, it, it manifested itself, of course, and some guys taking some bribes and some guys um, not even being aware of it. But you had, you know, you, you, so it, it wasn't, it, it was, it was a team full of dissension um, and just not as good as the Reds. So I, I always felt that the Reds get, um, you know, they, they, they sort of, it's like the World Series was just handed to them. Right. Um, and there is a lot of dispute about just how many of those games the White Sox actually did throw after the opener. Um you know, and that's part of why it was such a big deal, because once you insert the possibility of uh, gamblers, then the whole notion of the sport, um, you know, dies. So so that's, you know, that really was the big lesson from that one, which is, you know, beyond what I wrote about, about the Reds being the better team is that, you know, if you have any, any suspicion that the games are not on the level, then you don't have a sport, which is why right. that rule is so, is so uh, severe. 1986, game one. That was Hurst and Darling um, at Shea Stadium, and Hurst uh, Hurst won and won nothing. I mean, Chiraldi closed it out, but it was an error by Tim Tuffle that let in the only run. Um, ironic because it was another ground ball through through somebody's legs, uh, <laughs> which would end Game Six. But yeah, that was Hurst and Darling, and they they hooked up again in Game Seven, um, and that was a little different result for the Sox. <laughs> Um, for most of our lifetimes, the idea of the Cubs or the Red Sox winning a World Series was kind of far-fetched. Um, and you write about a person at the heart of building both of those teams into World Series champions uh, in the book, Theo Epstein. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of into analytics, but more so just enjoy watching the games for the the game's sake and the stadium's sake and the environment's sake, you know. But I thought that was really fascinating to learn about the different really brilliant approaches he took to analyzing what it takes to world, win a world series and how each of those franchises at the state that they were in could win it. Um, so uh, can you tell us how he went about turning them both the, the Red Sox and the Cubs into world series uh, champions? Yeah. I mean, you know, with the Red Sox, he had, he had some big pieces in place already that Dan Duquette had, had, had left behind. You know, he had, he had uh, Derek Lowe and, and, and Varitek. He had uh, John, Johnny Damon, and he had Manny Ramirez and Nomar. Um, and Nomar, he ended up trading, which was very astute because he, he recognized like where the weaknesses were, whether they, they really needed to shore up in, in 04 and was willing to do that. Um, but he took the, that, that kind of core and built up around it in a really shrewd way, you know, with, with guys who were gonna get on base and have, have some pop. Um, they, they came very close in 03, but they had some real, they had two real weak spots, one in the rotation and one in the bullpen. And so he set out to fix those two. And he did with, 
with Kurt Schilling in the rotation and, and Keith Folk in the bullpen. It was it, it ended up making making all the difference. Um, but he, he and his team basically, you know, came in with a with an open, a very open mind um, to say that, you know, remember, we don't our operating principles that we don't know anything. So, you know, be question everything, you know, question all convention and really look at at what the what the rules are. And at that time, it was like, you know, who gets into the playoffs, right? It's it's what's the baseline we got to root for or uh, shoot for. And it was 95 wins. Like if you win 95 games, you're you, almost every single time you're going to make it. So that was their bar. And it's a high bar, but that was the bar that they always kept in mind, 95 wins. And if we do that enough, we'll get enough shots where it'll, it'll break our way once or twice. And it did. Um, one thing that he told me that was fascinating was that it's so, <laughs> when you're a GM trying to build these teams, you know, you get this range of outcomes um, that they, that they program, you know, they give, they have 10,000 possible outcomes for any, any roster you know, based on all the different types of seasons that, that someone might have or injury problems or, you know, things you worry about, like, well, you know, will Pedro hold up or not, you know, or, or, or will, will Schilling's fly ball tendency, uh, you know, go off the, off, the, off the chart, literally. So um, he's like, all of them are real possibilities. All of them are, have ranges of, of what can happen. And you have to live with one of those outcomes. You know, you may build a team that could go 100 and, you know, win 120 games, but that same group could also win 70 games if everything breaks all the wrong way. So he's like, you just, you have to try to do everything to shift the odds in your favor. Um, if you see one problem area, attack it with redundancy, um, you know, bring in extra guys to, to, to give you more depth. Um, a lot of this stuff that they really just, uh, believed in and had that sort of youthful uh, energy to just pursue uh, everything and, and, and to look at someone like Bill James and say, this guy is really smart. Why has he never worked for a team? Like, don't we want smart people to at least advise us, uh, you know, and make us think of something else. They hired Bill James. So, you know, things like that, that the industry had just never really caught on to. Um, you know, Theo and, and his group, uh, you know, were really good at it. And I think we've seen, you know, uh, the last 20 years in particular, uh, just how important it is to have smart people run the show. I think now smart people run just about every every team. Um, but for a long time, it was just like everyone just sort of did it the same way. And no one really thought to convent, to uh, challenge conventional wisdom. 1992, game two. 92 game two that was David Cohn and John Smoltz down in Atlanta that was the game that um, that swung things the the Blue Jays way when uh, Ed Sprague hit a big home run um, you know in the ninth inning off Jeff Reardon which I get into in the book where Sprague talks about how that moment really catapulted him from a a, a, a sort of former Olympian kind of prospect who didn't really have a spot to uh, you know a guy the Blue Jays you know made a move Kelly Gruber to give him this give him that spot the next year because uh he hit that home run and, and started fulfilling his promise that one I remember because I, I know that Cone pitched the two World Series games both in Atlanta you know he Cone didn't pitch at home in that series and then I remember uh the, the cover Sports Illustrated which used to come out after the first two games um and it had it was like a sideways cover and it had a play at the plate where John Smoltz was you know, had just tagged the guy at the plate and he was holding it. So that's how I remember these things. Like, I remember like, okay, like I, I know that image of Smoltz and I know that, yeah, I don't, I don't have an image of Cone pitching in the white uniform at home in that World Series, only the road ones, you know, so, and I know we didn't start the opener. So it's, you just kind of do this instant process of elimination to get, you know, to get to these, to, to, <laughs> that, that's how my brain works. In it. Just, it's too bad there's not some version of the Scripps uh, spelling bee. I don't know if it's sponsored by Scripps where this, you know, you could see you on awesome, stage. Right? Hmm? That would be awesome. Yeah. If, if this was, if this was more useful than, uh, than it is, <laughs> I could win all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I'm just right. like, you know, if, if they had Jeopardy just out of like World Series uh, starting pitcher trivia, I, I, I'd be the next in Jennings. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> You mentioned Tim Tuffle's error and alluded to Buckner's error, and you have a chapter about goats uh, or the other side of glory, you know, in the World Series. And I loved your uh, 
since the, you know this podcast or this video series is about sports, but also society. Also, I mean that play uh, Buckner worked its way into pop culture um, through Seinfeld, and you actually interviewed Larry David yeah. for the book, and he told you some great stories. What what is your takeaway from sort of that moment in World Series history and how it entered uh, pop culture in a way that even non baseball fans are familiar with it, and and how um, and Buckner seemed to have a really um, tough life in some ways, but a great attitude in other ways, and eventually some reconciliation with Red Sox fans about that moment. Yeah, um, you know, it, it kind of became a, the name Buckner or, or the Bill Buckner error sort of became synonymous with um, failure in, in a big spot or, or blowing, blowing it, um, choking, whatever. Um, and there's context to everything, right? Like the game was already tied. Um, it wasn't Buckner's decision to be out there. He had been removed for defense and every other win. The manager, John McNamara, let him in because he wanted to, he thought he deserved to be out there, um, having gutted through the whole postseason on, on bad on bad legs. Um, there were, the bases were empty with two outs and a two-run lead. And Calvin Chiraldi gave up three singles. And then, you know, Stanley threw a wild pitch. And so it took a lot to get to that situation. Um, and Buckner was was blamed for everything because that's how we think, you know, over the years, all the nuance sort of bleeds away. And it's this dramatic um, image of a, of a guy, you know, leaning over for a ground ball and the ground ball going through your legs and the winning run scoring. It's about as emphatic, uh, easy to understand moment as you could have. And so Buckner had to wear it for the rest of his life. Um, but, you know, and, and he had his, his, some struggles dealing with that, but also, um, you know, he had to find his own sort of peace with it. Um, but I found it really interesting. You know, he died a few years ago. And so he wasn't, you know, available to talk about it, obviously, but I, I wanted to talk to someone who'd give me a different perspective on it. And Larry David, um, I thought was interesting because he did a whole Curb Your Enthusiasm episode based around um, Bill Buckner. And that's, you, you can't really pull that off um, unless Buckner or unless the person has some sort of cross culture um, uh, notoriety, right? Like, you know, I, so, so Buckner was famous enough, I guess, to pull it off. And Larry David was sort of the perfect guy to do it because he's so, um, so, uh, cynical sort of and 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 crabby uh, you know the character um and he said that when he first got the script he thought um well i mean the, the end of the end of the episode is bill buckner catches a, a a baby falling from a burning building and and then he's the hero and everybody lifts him on their shoulders and he makes the big play you know to save a life rather than to lose the world series and Larry Davis said his comedic instinct was to have him actually drop the baby somehow <laughs> he's like that's how sick i am you know but uh but he said he really did want him to catch it because he felt that there was something in working with Buckner on that episode, he felt that there was something um, just so pure about the guy. And so um, just something that really resonated like his story and a, a kind of sadness that he not needed to redeem, but wanted to redeem, you know, wanted to give this guy a, a, a hand um and give him a moment uh, even if it was scripted moment but give him something that he he deserved i mean this is a guy who had you know he was a a near hall of famer i mean he won a batting title he was an all-star he had 2500 2700 hits something like that um just a, a tremendous career and to be redeemed by someone who who is has a decided lack of sentiment i mean he's built his career larry david around like no sentiment you know, no very special episodes, no crying, no, you know, stuff like that. Larry David teared up in, in the uh, in the editing room. He said every time he would see Buckner catch that baby, you know, and, and try to frame it, he would, it, it, it really uh, warmed his heart. And and it's sort of like, you know, the Grinch looking down at uh, at Whoville and, and, and realizing that his heart is growing, you know, three sizes. Like, you know, that's, if you can, if you can, uh, impress Larry David with your, you know, if you can make Larry David sympathetic for you, you know, you're, you're a pretty, uh, a sympathetic figure. And, and he really did love uh, his time working with Buckner on that show. 2015 game five. 
That was the last game of the series. That was Matt Harvey and uh, Edison Volquez uh, re, uh, repeat. And, you know, Harvey, of course, took the shutout into the ninth inning and the Royals came back and tied it. And, um, you know, th- that was a that was a really great game because if you remember, like, like there was the tying run was on third, the bottom of the ninth, Eric Hosmer, it's two to one and there's one out and um, it's ground ball to third. And so right you know, throws over to first, that's the second out, and a clean throw home ends game five and sends it to game six with DeGrom pitching and then Syndergaard. So that was like such a bold move by the Royals just to go for it. And it really um, symbolized to me the whole Royals ethos then, which was just, we are going to take it to you. Um, They weren't going to hit a lot of home runs. They didn't have the big money power hitters, but they were like, they were going to play their style of game aggressive all the way. If they were going to go down, they were going to go down aggressively. And they knew in that moment that, you know, David Wright, you know, had a kind of loopy throw because he had, you know, back problems and everything. Um, and, that, and that if once Duda got it, Duda had an erratic arm. So the chances of make, forcing the defense to, to make the perfect play with imperfect defenders, um, that was the right, that was the right move there, even though the risk was very high that they would lose the game. That was a bold risk-taking team and you don't see that very much nowadays um there's such an aversion to risk um and i just thought that you know that really symbolized everything about the royals and how they did it differently you know that series was i think it was so important that there's been at least one maybe only one um real small market team that was able to win the world series in this day and age because if you didn't have the royals as an example then you know, all the Pirates and 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 Rays and Oakland A's, all these teams, you know, that, that may be borderline and hopeless anyway, they can at least say, you know what, those guys did it. They got there twice in a row and they won it. And so it's not impossible. So I thought it was very important that the Royals won that series and uh, and they sure did. A couple more. Um, what do you think about the just the future of the World Series? I, I'm thinking back before interleague play, like it was a big deal for an American league team to be playing a national league team before divisions, you had to be the best team over 162 games to get there. You know, now we've got so many wild card teams. It's just different um, as far as making it to the world series and how special it is. Uh, does it seem as cool to you as it did in the past? Do you think um, the world series will continue to have sort of the cultural hold that it's had in the past Um with the way things have changed, is there uh, something new that might even make it more special than it's been in the past? Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question and, and very valid. Um, I don't think it will get back to the um, the cultural sort of height that it that it had um, in the pre playoff era. Um, I think the playoffs have become such a part of sort of any any sport um that it's it's sort of now thought of as the whole postseason uh rather than just the series or, or when it was just lcs world series now there's so many playoff games and they're fun you know they're they're great they give more teams a shot it's it's a it's a check on the um dominance of the 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 small the the large market big payroll teams right if you give mm-hmm. six teams now in each league a chance to get to the world series it, it it means that a team like the dodgers with 111 wins could lose in the first round which we just saw on well, the second round um last year so so but with that the flip side of that is that you may not you usually don't get the the two best teams facing each other in the series um and you don't have you know you have more chances for big moments in in other rounds um so i you know, it's still really special once you get there. Um, and it still attracts millions and millions of, of viewers. And it still wins the ratings week or month or whatever, which is why the networks um, and people watch it live. So the networks pay a ton of money for it. Um, but when they stopped doing day games in the 80s, um, I think it lost something. It lost a kind of uh, appointment TV sort of feel. Um, a lot of people just don't watch it. I mean, yes, millions and millions do watch it, but not 40 million. Like, you know, we saw it when we, when you and I were, were little. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, you could say that everything is, is less, but the NFL is, is, 
is still, uh, you know, gets crazy ratings, whether that's from gambling and fantasy, and, you know, I know that's all part of it, but um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's very, very special. It's something that you can always uh, cherish when your team goes there. Um, but nationally, you know, the highest rated world series game ever was Phillies Royals in 1980. Right. And nowadays, if it's Phillies, you know, Phillies Astros in the world series, you're not going to get crazy widespread interest outside of the two local markets. And part of that's on baseball. It's, it's, it's been very, very good at marketing locally. And to, I think somewhat to the, uh, to the diminishment of, of the national brand. Okay, you're going back to your first World Series, 1979, Game 6. Game 6, that was Palmer coming back home to have a chance to close out the Pirates, but John Candelaria, the Candyman, um, won that game. Palmer pitched pretty well. I think he, he had a shutout in the 6th or 7th or something, but, uh, you know, the Orioles uh, didn't have much offense those last three games, and, and Candelaria uh, took care of them. I think Tocolby got the save, or Tocolby got the last few outs and then did it again in Game 7. And one last question for you. Um, what are your thoughts on expansion or uh, franchises moving in MLB living here in Nashville? There's talk um, about possibility of getting a team in Nashville, uh, the way the city has grown. Do you think that there is any um, truth or hope to that uh, uh, rumor that, that Nashville might get a major league team someday? I think baseball would love would love Nashville. Um but I just, I don't know if there's, I don't know enough about the political uh, landscape down there or the um, willingness or feasibility of a new stadium, um, because that's what it's all about. And baseball has been saying for years that they want to expand um, to 32. Uh, it's a growth business. Uh, it's, it's, you know, 32 is a better number for the schedule, um, all of that, but that they can't do anything until they figure out Tampa Bay and Oakland. And we've been hearing that for over a decade now that if you have two franchises that need new stadiums you can't award two new cities um franchises because then you know they lose all their leverage like you know as long as las vegas is out there as a as a possibility for the oakland a's then that creates some pressure to maybe get the stadium built that they want in oakland okay. uh if you were to just snap your fingers and say okay nashville and uh Las Vegas get franchises, then you're still stuck with Tampa and and Oakland um, in a, in a in a wanting a new ballpark. So it's very very tedious. Um, it's been such a uh, you know so many ideas and uh, you know two franchises. You could have half the season in Montreal, half the season in Tampa, which is the silliest thing I ever heard. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe I think the markets I see with Montreal, Vegas. And Nashville are the ones you hear about um, the most, but it's such a uh, arduous process to get the kind of stadium that you need. That I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely the 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 will is there, but the reality is I don't know when we're going to see this, and I, mm -hmm. I would not even want to put a date on it because it's just to actually get, as they say, shovels on the ground is extraordinarily difficult anywhere, uh, yeah. especially anywhere in California where Oakland wants to do and um sounds like Nashville too is going to be a a, a battle there with the Titans and want right. to the new they want a new stadium right yeah I'm talking about it it's incredible here. like yeah. they, you know there wasn't even a stadium there when I was there in college <laughs> 30 you know 25 years ago um and they already want a new one but new I guess one. you know well Tyler, thank you. This is a great book uh, recommended to any baseball fan, the grandest stage. Uh, tell us where people can follow you and where they can buy the book. Well, they can buy it uh, anywhere books are sold. It seems like it's in, uh, you know, every bookstore I go to seems to have a copy, which is great. And, um, or you can just go on Amazon, support, support whoever you want. Um, support me. Okay. But, but um, yeah, no, you can get it out there anywhere. I'm on uh, Twitter at Tyler Kepner. You can find all my work at the New York Times. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, Bam. Um, you know, I, everybody should know that Andrew is, is an expert, um, fantasy player. Well, it, fantasy simulated fantasy with old time players. So when, when we talk about baseball history, um, Andrew is a, uh, what, three-time champ? Three-time champion. Three -time, yeah. I've only got two. So this is the master right here. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Someday uh, you can aspire to my, 
you know, greatness, Tyler. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Was, <laughs> well, we are multi-time winners. Yeah. And some people haven't even won once, right, Mitch? So, anyway. Many people, uh, like yeah. uh, Mitch Light. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who's going to be starting game one of the 2023 World Series? Wow. Um, well, my son would, 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 uh, dis, you know, he would, he would run away from home if, if, uh, I said anybody other than my like Zach Wheeler or Aaron Nola or something like that, cause he's got the Phillies going right back. So, um, right. we'll say, uh, we'll say Zach Wheeler against, uh, and the Astros always make it. Let's pick someone else. Let's say Garrett Cole. Let's say another Phillies, uh, Phillies Yankees World Series, the East Coast bias sort of thing. I don't know. Yeah. All right. There you go. You're here to her first. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Have a great day. Good talking to you. Too, man. Yep. All right. Take care.